the cigar as you see it here and what you guys are selling and photographing, by the time it gets here, the tobacco was planted at least two, two and a half years ago. So how we start from a seed and get to this, and, and not just the time, 300 people have probably touched the components of this. And that's kind of the handmade amazingness of it, but also the kind of the art and time and craft that goes into preparing the tobacco to get here. So I know a lot of times we are the undisputed best place to buy a cigar, certainly price wise. Uh, but it always amazes me when people people say, man, cigars cost a lot. I think when you when, after today, when you understand what goes into it, it's amazing that they cost what they do and not you know, so much more. So in the beginning, let's start at, at kind of the top, which is the first four weeks of the plant's life cycle really starts with the seeds. And a lot of this will probably start to sound familiar. If you guys have done any of your own gardening or uh, are kind of a amateur botany and enthusiasts, but a lot of what goes on even planting any crop here or anywhere in the world is very similar to how tobacco is grown. Tobacco itself is actually classified as a weed. Uh, I mean, it grows incredibly quickly and it's you know, kind of has a life of its own on how the, the seeds disperse. So even when you're driving around tobacco country in Nicaragua and Honduras, you'll see kind of a beautiful farm. And then, you know, even across the street, you'll see these kind of weird rogue tobacco plants just growing anywhere that they find a little niche to, to grab onto. But the seed itself is literally the side of, of pinpoint. Just what's in that guy's hand could plant 10 acres of tobacco. And so we're working with things that are very microscopic and each seed, there, there, there's four basic seed types. You have your, your Indonesian variety, which includes Sumatra, Cameroon, uh, and, and it's, they're all variations of Sumatra seeds because that's where the seed actually was first grown, was in Indonesia. You have your Connecticut seeds, um, which obviously were first grown in Connecticut. You have your Habano seeds, which all have a history and legacy from Cuba. And then you also have a what I call this fourth seed bucket, which is kind of a more exotic <laughs> group of tobaccos that are grown in different places that <laughs> technically started in Cuba, but have kind of morphed out into their own. And those are things like uh, that you may have heard of like Matafina and Arapiraca and, and San Andres. So these kind of uh, more boutique exotic tobaccos, but the Connecticut, the Sumatra and the Bono are all kind of your key three seed groups. Um, if you're reading the descriptions, you've talked to customers, you've probably heard people say Sumatra, Ecuador, or Connecticut from Honduras, or Connecticut, Connecticut. The first word there is always the seed varietal, and the second word is the country where it's grown. So Connecticut seeds, for example, are grown in Connecticut, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Honduras, all the same seeds, but depending on where they're grown, they kind of have a, a different profile. Some of the characteristics are all the same in terms of kind of how the leaf looks, and maybe its size, but flavor-wise, those different climates and, and uh, terroirs will, will give a, a different uh, flavor experience uh, to the customer. Uh, similarly, you have Sumatra when it's grown in, in, in Indonesia. We have various names for that, uh, Java and, and uh, uh, Basuki, different things. When it's grown in Ecuador, I mean, night and day difference. It's spicy, it's strong, it's full of nicotine. When you grow it in Indonesia, it's, it's less nicotine. So my point is when you, when you start talking about seeds and countries, you'll start to see things like Habano, Ecuador, Sumatra, Ecuador. Seed variety, country where it's grown. So uh, seeds first go into the greenhouse. Looks like your standard greenhouse you guys probably see around here. Those little black plastic trays that you buy your geraniums or whatever, or your, that's the same stuff we're working with. We're working with a nutrient rich type of kind of potting soil that has low density because what we're trying to do when we first plant those seeds is allow the, the roots to start to take, take form. So it's a very kind of nice loose soil and we'll put six seeds in each of these little one inch by one inch squares or one inch uh, diameter holes and begin the watering process. 
they'll be in the greenhouse and in the trays for about four weeks. That's the first four weeks of the tobacco's life. And during that time, by hand, mind you, we have people that are going to go through uh, throughout the process, certainly about once a week, and start to see which of those six seeds are taking. It's, it's kind of an addition by subtraction process. We're not going to grab the best one. We're going to start by looking at which ones are struggling. Simply just remove those. By the end of the four weeks, uh, you know, by week three, we may have two competing plants in the same tray. And towards that last week, we will have decided which which one gets to uh, survive on its own. So traditionally now at week four, we babied these leaves uh, over, over the time, especially in those first two weeks while we're wanting those roots to take form. And we want to be very gentle with the plant. The watering is, is kind of a misting system. We're not throwing water on it. But as we're getting ready to move them from those trays by hand into the field, where they're gonna go for the next 60 days, after the first two weeks after babying them, the next step is we need to toughen them up. Because once they kind of leave the protection of the greenhouse, they're kind of on their own for the elements. They've got the wind, the sun. So we start to kind of mess with the tobacco a little bit. A lot of different people do it different ways, but probably one of the more common is that if you saw those trays, how they're laid out in rows like a big table like this, we actually affix a lawnmower to it. And we run the lawnmower off all the tips of the leaves just to break the tip off. And what that does is it takes the plant from saying, oh my goodness, you know, you know I've, I've had this great life. Now that it's in shock, like something's happening to me. And so the plant then kind of wakes up and says, I've got to work hard to, to survive. And that's that last stretch where the roots start to really try to grow deeper because now it's in it's in trouble so that's just a very cool fun fact that people don't know because they see these lawn mowers and us mowing this tobacco going what what are you doing so uh week four we move them by hand to the field uh watering process kind of occurs over the next 60 days but the plant's going to grow to about three feet to four feet, depending on where it is in the field, uh, the kind of region that we're in, how the sunlight, uh, how much sunlight it gets. And uh, by the end of the 60 days, it is at full maturity, about this high. And it has roughly anywhere from 18 to 24 leaves, depending on the variety that we're growing. So this is actually a great example. I don't know if you guys can see of what a mature tobacco look, a plant looks like. So by now, they're, they're the, the farmers are actually seeing the leaves instead of kind of coming up at an angle, start to open and droop, which means plants reach full maturity. So I say that's in the, in the farm and mature at 60 days. The truth is they actually start picking this after 30 days. They actually pick it the last 30 days of its life. But if you just let it grow for 60 days, this is what it looks like. So on day 60, so remember, first 30 days it's in greenhouses, second 60 it's in the farm. On day 60, we actually start picking. And we start picking the plant from the bottom to the top. And Traditionally, because of how the plant absorbs nutrients, your stronger tobaccos that are fuller bodied are at the bottom of the plant. The medium kind of strength ones are in the middle and your strongest leaves are going to be at the top. This is because of how the plant gets the sun and how the nutrients are distributed. But what we also do when we grow the plant is obviously you guys know strong cigars are very popular. We'll mess with the plant while it's in the farm to try to give us as much strength as possible. Strength is kind of a product of, of the nutrients that the leaves are getting. So if we want a strong leaf of tobacco, we need more nutrients to the leaves. So this picking process where we pick the bottom third of the plant and then wait a week, pick the middle, and then pick the top a week apart, is literally done so that we can actually continue to manipulate the amount of nutrients that these leaves are getting. So once we get rid of that bottom third, 
the roots are still driving the same amount of nutrients, but it's going to fewer leaves. So those are continuing for these last weeks to give each one further up more and more nutrition. Something else we'll do uh, when we want strong cigars is tobacco has a beautiful flower, but we never let it bloom. As soon as we see it coming in, we get rid of it. Why? Because I don't want the, the plant's nutrition to feed the flower. I'd rather have the nutrition going to the leaves, and if the flower's there, then it's just taking away from what we could have for the leaves. So these are all kind of small ag agricultural uh, processes that really the farmers have developed over a hundred years to manipulate the plant. Um, so the stronger leaves, as you get towards the top, have a thicker texture, medium texture, thin texture. That coincides with the strength. The thin texture is a little milder, the medium texture is a little more medium, and the heavy, thick textures at the top are stronger. So if you guys have ever been on the phone or been reading some of the documentation or the brand descriptions, you hear people talking about the fillers as a Seiko, a Viso, and a Lajero. Certainly, I think you've heard Lajero. The Seiko, which means second, is actually the lower. The Visos are in the middle and the Lajeros are on the top. So that's actually the definition. It, it has mainly to do with the texture, but that really co coincides to where it came from on the plant. The strength, ultimately, in that texture, when you break it down from a, from a chemistry standpoint, is derived from the nicotine. And then when you talk about things like flavor, those are really derived from the sugar contents. So your nicotine is going to be least on the bottom of the plant and highest on the top. And then your sugars actually will be lowest at the top, lowest at the bottom, and highest in the middle. So typically where your sugar leaves are in the middle, more flavor. Where the nicotine's higher, more strength, more body. So we're at day 90 now, right? Four weeks in the beds, 60 days in the field. We're at day 90. So where does the tobacco go? Now we're moving into the next phase of the process, which is called curing. We'll move the leaves from the farm to the barn, where we will actually sew about six to eight leaves together, and we will suspend them up in the barn to the ceiling from the, from the top to the bottom to allow a little bit of airflow. And then during this time, it's very much like seeing leaves change in the fall, you know, around here. They're gonna move from a green to a brown. And this is really the beginning of the chemical reaction that breaks down the, you know, the chlorophyll and some of the proteins into the sugars and really delivers this color that ultimately becomes a cigar. But when you're in the barn, you'll see anything from green phases and yellows and browns, again, similar to how you'd see leaves turn here. This process can take anywhere from 45 to 60 days, sometimes 30. It depends on the tobacco, but really it also depends on how the barn is monitored. Uh, the things like humidity and temperature are hugely important to this process. And if you have too much humidity or too much temperature, uh, you can get mold and rot and lose your whole crop. So during this time, very careful monitoring of humidity, temperature. Uh, Different things, very natural ways of employing things are done. Uh, specifically, the barn has windows. If we need more airflow, maybe maybe uh, adjust the temperature. We'll open up the windows. We'll open up the doors. Let it cool down. If we need to take humidity out or raise heat, they'll actually burn little fires inside the barn. Very dangerous. Lots of barns have burned down with lots of tobacco over time. Uh, but this process is what's called air curing. Um, it is all natural, and it's in fact the same exact process they do here in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania. And as a little bonus uh, piece of info, what's really unique about the tobacco that's grown and cured here in Lancaster is that they burn, I want to say, what's the wood? The skeet? No, it's, um, what is it? Hickory. Hickory, yeah. So they burn hickory in the barns in Lancaster, which is why I don't know how many cigars are still using that wrapper. When people smoke the, some of the tobacco from Lancaster County, they say that it has kind of like a like smoky barbecue kind of flavor to it. And that's because of the wood that they burn during the curing process actually has that impact that you taste years later when you actually burn it. 
So, curing is done. Yeah, so that's as it came into the barn on the right, and on the left, that's when it's getting ready to leave the barn. These leaves are still very moist. They're not dry by any means. Uh, I know people look at the picture and may think that that's kind of crackly and dry. They actually still have some humidity. They certainly don't have the same internal humidity they did when they, when they came in. But if we, if we're moving from here now into the fermentation process. the fermentation process, we will continue to lower the humidity. And what, what the goal is, is kind of what we started in the curing process, which is breaking down the organic materials and some of these proteins into sugars. It's going to make the tobacco more combustible, but by extracting some of that organic material, uh, it's going to you know, kind of bring out that natural sweetness. If you smoked tobacco that had not gone through this process, first, it really would have a difficult time burning and, and combusting. So in a cigar, that would be like staying lit. But also the tobacco itself would have a very, what people call it, these taste young or these taste fresh. It's a very vegetal or, or uh, it's like smoking grass or leaves, basically. Uh, like kind of just a very grassy vegetal taste. And that's what we want to get rid of. And that's what happens during fermentation. So when we bring the leaves from the barns, we build pilons which are basically these well-organized piles of tobacco. And what happens within this is a chemical reaction that really starts with the moisture from the tobacco. The more moist it is, the faster and hotter this, this process takes. But basically, the weight that is happening within that pile is creating, it's, it's like the initial process or the initial phases of rot. We don't want the tobacco to rot, but we want it to kind of start that process. And the byproduct is a heavy ammonia smell, and the byproduct of it is also heat. That's how we know it's working, is that the tobacco's temperature is really increasing. And that's that organic material breaking down into the sugars. It's a chemical reaction that generates that. So if anyone's ever, have anyone here like ever, like do your yard work or whatever, have a compost pile, this is, this process is identical to composting. We just actually don't want it to start to disappear. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> We've gone too far. Um, so what we do to monitor how the tobacco is working is we got very long thermometers we stick into the middle of that pile. And it was 80 degrees when we started and as it starts to get up towards like maybe 110 and 115, we know that okay, if we let this keep going, the whole leaf is gonna to start to fall apart, break down. So how we stop that is we actually start taking the pile apart, shaking the leaves, bringing them back down to 80 degrees, and then we rebuild that pile again. And what we try to do is the stuff that was kind of on the outside of the pile, the next time we build it goes into the middle, we do a little rotating, and the process starts again, and we stick the thermometer in, and we check it, and once it gets to 115, and we just keep doing this process until the tobacco is ready to smoke. Uh, this process, you know, if you remember, we were we were a month in the in the seed beds, sixty days in the fields, another sixty days in the curing. This process can take as long as eighteen months. So by the time this is done, we're two years old, and the master blender or the the I guess, chief tobacconist within the factory is the one who determines when it's done. And to do that, they'll chew the tobacco, they'll burn it, see how it combusts, they will uh, smoke it. I mean, literally a, a myriad of processes before that they know that it's right. Once it's cured properly, it's either going to get used right away, which is kind of how things are going right now, because no one has tobacco because we're in the middle of this crazy thing. Or it will be dried and put into bales to <laughs> sit and, and lay dormant. And once that tobacco dries, some of those processes still continue. But when you dry the tobacco, it kind of stops the tobacco from wanting to, to work for itself. Yeah. So you said that they're putting barrels to dry. Do they go through a process to regain any moisture or once they're dry, they actually are at that point and that's it? That's a really good question, and I didn't 
bring it up because I didn't want to give you guys too much information, but since you've asked, I will answer it. So when we build the pallone and it comes from the curing bar, it's got a lot of moisture and it starts at 80 degrees, but within two days, it'll go to 115. Then we take it and we shake it and we rebuild it. The next time it may take five days to go from, from 80 to 110, 115. And then when we rebuild it, it could take 20 days. Eventually we'll build the Pallone and it won't go from 80, it won't, it'll just stop completely. And that's when we kind of know it's time to check. Uh, so we'll burn it, we'll light it. You know, usually unless it's a very fine, thin tobacco, it's going to need another process. But to your point, that moisture is all gone. So how do we, how do we get it to start again? The water is the answer. What we'll do is we will then apply water to the tobacco to reintroduce moisture and then build the pallone again. And then it starts again where we're going to, in two days, go from 80 to 115. And then, you know, over the course of maybe six months, it will just stop. And then that's our indication again. Let's let's see where we're at. Do we want to we want to start this process again or is the tobacco ready to go it's a great question because you're right as it as it ferments as that process occurs the moisture is is leaving so uh where do we leave off oh uh, let's um can we take a wrapper off a cigar and even when it's dry as it ages it, the tobacco is still dying basically you know once it's done fermenting it's pretty much dead but there is still some organic material that over the aging process continues to die. So, you know, there are people who really like to age their cigars or age tobacco. And what they find is that it, it, it be, they, they say it becomes a more refined cigar uh, uh, or more elegant. Uh, the truth is, is that it's, it's losing some of its sugars and flavors. So it, in my opinion, it becomes more muted. And sometimes that can be good if you got a really strong cigar, a little extra aging can kind of really round it out and take some of the edge off. But if you go too long, uh, I mean, I smoked a cigar for 1864 once and uh, it was not a very pleasant experience, but I, got, <laughs> I get to tell people that I've done it. So I think there is a, a kind of a limit to it. Uh, I was gonna just burn a leaf, burn a wrapper. Do we have like a wrapper we can just light on fire? No, it's just gonna dissect it and then like, we can use Then we'll burn it? So we'll talk about what's inside the cigar here in a minute, but I wanted to, uh, if we talk about when is a cigar ready, I always like to say that it's all about how it burns, right? And how, if it's if it still has too much organic material that it, it won't combust. And that's what I'm gonna try to show you guys here. That one's coming apart like a... It's kinetic. Yeah, well, it's good. This will be a really good one for the uh, experiment. This is Connecticut wrapper grown in Ecuador. So it's a very thin tobacco. But you can imagine, even if you burned leaves before, you can imagine if this has a high moisture content, a high level of organic material, I may light it, it may burn for a little bit, but without any sort of an accelerant or blowing on it, it'll just go out, right? Now, tobacco that's been worked and fermented, or any leaf for that matter, and this is also a really cool kind of point about how they warn you when you compost that you've got to be careful because it can catch on fire. That's because of the heat from the process, but also as the leaves die, they become highly combustible. So the best test to tell if tobacco is ready is to light it and start counting. One, two, three, four. But I'm, I'm just gonna stop counting because this is literally going to burn for, I mean, this may not stop. Watch the table. Yeah, it's okay. That's a Keith problem. <laughs> so it's not how fast it burns, it's just going to keep spreading. Uh, yeah, and I mean, you can even see how fast it's combusting. It's insane. Now, it doesn't combust like this when it's in a cigar because we have density, we have multiple leaves, and some of the other leaves are heavier, and we're going to go over that, that actually slow the combustion of the wrapper, and it'll burn evenly. So, I mean, this is still going. 
I, I hope that kind of illustrates just how, how crazy that is, that the process then creates this kind of combustibility. So, so mm -hmm. the back part of the filler, they're all, they're all from the same process, right? Those, those are all still the same back of the dinner, but like a different process. They come from the same plant okay. and same process. So uh, that's a great question. It's actually right where we're heading, um, but I'm gonna stop us for just a moment uh, to, before we go there, for you guys that took some of the cigars, uh, those are single region, one tobacco, one farm tobaccos. That is not a blend. So a cigar is usually a blend of different tobaccos. What's cool about those is we have the Seiko, which is the bottom third, the Viso, the middle, and the Lajero. We talked about how the strength and the sugars are different. Now you will have an opportunity to smoke a leaf <laughs> from the same plant from different spots to actually taste the difference, feel the texture of those samples. When you smoke them, you'll, you'll see, oh, that Seiko, it's not as strong. The Viso is a little stronger and the Lajero is stronger. So that's really the samples are giving you a chance to smoke and experience the, uh, the plant classification. It's just a binder on the outside? No, there is no binder. It's 100% filler. We used a filler leaf as a binder, so it's 100% filler. And because it's from a single region and not a blend, just a little side comment for those of you who want to kind of challenge yourselves to something a little bit extra. Don't just think about the, uh, the strength or the sweetness or like the, the flavor. When you hold the smoke on your tongue because it's a single region, what you're gonna find that your tongue is, is divided up into, into zones to taste flavors. You have the sweet, the bitter, the salt, the acidic, and things like wine tasting and food tasting, it's the same thing, they talk about that. So the tip of your tongue is your sweet receptor. The center back is your bitter receptor. Your acidic receptors are on the side rear and your salt are in the, the front uh, sides. But as you hold the smoke in your mouth and you think about your tongue and those regions, what you're going to start to see is that you'll feel kind of like almost like a tingling pop rock type sensation in one area. That's the, the, the zone that that tobacco is, is activating on your palate. And you get that from a single strand tobacco. Some maybe even do two different zones, but not the whole tongue at once. And that's why we blend tobacco together, because we want balance, right? We want the whole palate to activate equally. And um, so a cool thing is, you know, rarely do people have an opportunity to smoke single strand tobacco like that, but you're also, you, you probably won't find it very pleasant, but that's the reason for it. And that's why we actually blend with different tobaccos to try to create this holistic balanced experience on the palate. So that, that's kind of a, a added feature for you guys who are going to be trying the uh, the nicotine. Anybody who wanted to change their mind that maybe wants to try, um, we certainly have more. So let's talk a little bit about what you were what you were saying about the um, you know the wrapper, the binder, the filler. It is. It's all the same tobacco, and you have certainly wrappers that are Seikos and wrappers that are in the middle. Uh, that gets classified after it ferments or even during the fermentation process, we're starting to look at the tobacco and saying, that's going to be a good wrapper. That's going to be a good binder. And then usually if it doesn't qualify as either or two of those, then it's filler. So the wrapper we pick for its aesthetic qualities, uh, it needs to look very beautiful. If, if there's a what we call sun grown, which means it's just grown out in a farm in the open air in the sun, only 2% of the leaves we're going to harvest are actually going to qualify for wrapper. Very small. Then we have our binder, which we pick for its structural integrity because it's going to ultimately hold the bunch together. And then you have your fillers, which are in the middle. But yes, they all come from the same plant. And just like we would manipulate a plant to have maybe more nicotine or more strength, there are ways to manipulate the plant. Like I said, we, you know, if we just put it out in the sun and let nature have its way, we, about 2% would qualify as a wrapper grade leaf. There are things we can do such as uh, putting up giant cheese cloths. I don't know if you've seen pictures of Cuba and you see how the tobacco is grown under these canopies. Those canopies are created to provide more shade and be gentler on the plant and you get that beautiful, more wrapper look. So when it's grown under shade, you may get 50% wrapper, but it's an expensive thing to do. And, uh, but it's, you know, there's other ways to manipulate the plant to get that beautiful look. And uh, to give you kind of a, an idea, 
Uh, a pound of filler tobacco is maybe $6 a pound. A pound of binder tobacco, which is a little bit better, is maybe 10 or 11. And a pound of wrapper can be $50. So that's where the money's to be made. If anyone wants to get into the tobacco growing game, don't bother with the filler. <laughs>
in a base leaf in their hand. And then they'll do another one, they'll lay that one, and then they will take it and form the bunch. Then they take the bunch and they roll it in the wrapper, and then they take that, or the binder rather, and then they take that and roll it in the wrapper. But the cigar will taste totally different. They have to follow the instructions exactly. Depending on where that leaf gets put and placed in the bunch will affect you know, the, uh, the actual overall performance and flavor. So if one team doesn't put the ingredients together in the right order, you've got a consistency problem. Uh, I personally prefer the, the, the rolling machine. It's not really a machine, but it, it's what's called Lieberman. It's like a big cigarette roller where they lay the, the binder in, and then they, once they've made their bunch, they place it in, and they pull a lever, and it'll roll that, that binder. The reason being is because the machine itself, or the bunching Lieberman is what they call it, provides perfectly even pressure. And so you actually have a better quality cigar. Obviously, if someone's doing that by hand, you have different people that have different kind of you know, hand pressure. So you do get a little bit more inconsistency. But it, even if we're using that, it's not actually an automated machine. We still call that a handmade cigar. So, What keeps the cigar together? So the binder is what holds those three the, the filler tobaccos in place. And that's why we picked it for its heft and integrity. So like I said, after we bunched a few of our, our uh, accordion and, and made our bunch in our hand, and we want to go ahead and roll it, we lay our binder down, and now we roll the binder, and you get left with what begins to start to look like a cigar, an ugly cigar, but a cigar nonetheless. From here, we'll put it into a mold and a press to kind of help give it that shape. And then it goes to, my, I'm, the, I'm the buncher, then I send my mold when it's done pressing to the, to, the, to the roller. And they take that beautiful leaf and cut away some of the edges and pass that final piece of tobacco, which gives it that beautiful look. How would you um, explain the draw of a cigar and what can go wrong in the cigar when the bunching and the <laughs> well, some people have draw masters, which helps. So before maybe it gets to the roller, there are these kind of machines that will uh, gauge the pressure, kind of pull air through the bunch before we roll it, or before we apply the wrapper to see if there's a, a, a problem with it. And it's a great question because, I mean, we're talking about stuffing all these tobaccos in here and rolling this. I mean, if something gets knotted, what you end up with are... are burn problems, not combustion problems. Combustion would be an issue that the tobacco just won't burn, which usually has to do with it being under-fermented. Uh, burn problems tend to be because the bunch is not made correctly or there's a problem in the bunch where there's a tight spot on one side, so the scar starts to burn sideways. Or maybe they put the thinner tobaccos in the middle, and when, when they do that, you tunnel the cigar will burn in the middle. And that's because they didn't place the leaves in the right order. Um, and conversely, you can have a giant kind of cone burn where the wrapper and binder are burning too fast. That's because the opposite problem, they put the heavier tobaccos too much on the outside. So usually though, oh, go ahead. So is, that, is there one problem that's like more common than another? Cause like I know like we get customers all the time, like, oh, this tunnel, this did this, this yeah. was like, is there one that's like, okay, it probably didn't happen. Like <laughs> Right, of course, yeah. I mean, you have people that just want to game the system. I'll tell you yeah. that, that the, the rejection rate or the rate on non-Cuban cigars that are going to have problems is about 2 to 3%. So, uh, but, you know, as a customer, you spent $200 on this beautiful box of cigars. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's an expectation that they're all going to perform. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, there's no way that we know. Now, if you're going into a cigar store and you want to buy a cigar, there are things you can check, which I'll show you. We did that uh, accordion bunch, right? And I made my bunch. And I'll take another piece of tobacco, quote unquote tobacco. I'm gonna smoke this, I hope. Okay, so here's my second leaf. I place it in my bunch. Okay, now. I've got like kind of wild ends here on either end, and I need to uh, 
make it, give it more of its shape. So I've got about an inch, maybe two inches of extra tobacco up here. So what I'm gonna do, and this is not actually tobacco, but I mean, if it were, it would be dry and I could literally just take this and break the top off. And the way I would break it would be just like that. I'd take the top of my hand and I'd break the top of the tobacco. Then I'd take these smaller pieces and fill it in where there's little gaps to give it kind of that uniform fold. What's interesting is this part of the leaf that I just broke off right here is going to be the end that you cut, the head of the cigar. And if you notice in my hand, I broke the tobacco straight backwards. If while I'm doing this, I twist just a little bit as I break, I'm going to create a knot right about where the cigar, this is right about where the cigar band is gonna go. So usually when you have a draw problem where it's not drawing enough, or you have a problem where it's not burning right because of a draw problem, <laughs> it's occurring right around where the band is. And a lot of people notice that when they touch it, they'll go, oh, it feels like there's a knot here. And that's you know, when you're buying a single cigar, whenever I pick one up and I'm thinking about buying it, I, I like to run my, and kind of pinch top to bottom but I'm always paying a little bit of attention here. If it's hard right here, it's because when that guy broke the bunch, he, gave, he didn't do it straight, and there's a good chance he's gonna have a problem. So when Jaime goes over and he's spot checking cigars, and we have an order of 20,000 cigars coming, he doesn't go do this to 20,000 cigars, but he'll pull a random sample of maybe 200 or 300, and he will give it what we call a field test. Probably 10% of them, He'll have a concern about. So we'll separate out of the 300 he does with his hands, we'll pull 30. And he could kind of tell maybe something's up here. But then we will randomly draw test these to get a feel for the rejection rate. And the hope is at the end of the day of the 300 he tests that we don't have an instance really of more than two or three percent, which is kind of that average. If we do have a problem, then we've got a big problem and we're gonna work with the factory to, we're not gonna accept the cigars. And a lot of times what we do to give you guys great prices to pass them along to your customers is we're buying lots of cigars that people, you know, maybe there was a customer who didn't pay and now the factory needs to sell them to us and we'll get a great deal and these are great cigars. Sometimes they're bad batches and they say, oh, the customer didn't pay, they're great cigars. Oh, really? We'll be the judge of that. And, and then once we do our kind of spot check, you know, hey, this is kind of in the range of what we like, and we negotiate the price. So um, just a kind of a little, little tidbit about where you can usually identify a problem with a cigar and the reason why it happens. Also, What's that? that also about, like, when it's tight, when it's cold. What's that? When it's close. You can talk about when it's close too, the pores. You, I don't know what you're talking about, but why don't you go ahead and explain it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just telling Alex about, like, you can, by telling, uh, by looking at a cigar, you look at the foot of the cigar, too, and you can tell if you may or may not have a drunk problem when you, when, before lighting it. So one of the first things you do before smoking a cigar, you cut it, right? So you cut it, the first thing, like, you, you should do is, like, you do, like, a dry uh, drop, you know? Dry drop. You can, you can tell right there but uh, usually well, you won't really know the absolute truth to light it but another way to find out really is that by looking at the foot of the cigar if you, if, if, if you see this cigar right here it has pores I and mean, you can see you know there's would be pores air. yeah, yeah. would be air going in, into the cigar to be able to you know air glow to be able to burn in many cases especially at the, at the, at the factory uh, production down there, we find instances when we check the cigars that you can see if I press a cigar like that, you, you could see it just closes. So, but by just looking at the cigar, you're like, but this is not going to drop. When it's too close, it's too tight, you see there's no point for air uh, flow to, to go into the cigar. That's something you, you can look at it and, and tell. I, and that's I typically because the cigar was overpressed. They either made it too, too much tobacco and then they stuffed it into a tight mold. And, and that's a very different, I mean, but it's also something that can happen and something that we're checking. So when we have the 30, we'll either put them through the draw master, we'll cut them and just give it the old dry draw test. But hopefully if we're doing our job, you guys are getting less of those phone calls. So 
You can call and complain to him anytime you want. I'll be sure to give you the personal home phone number. <laughs> uh, so uh, then from there, the cigars, uh, because, you know, as we start working with the materials again, we wet the tobacco a little bit because obviously the, the buncher is now starting to, or the, the, the buncher is starting to actually bend the tobacco. So once, you know, they do get the materials, you'll see they've got a little squirt bottle. They'll be rehydrating the tobacco to make it more pliable, more workable. And as we know, when you add water to tobacco, it starts to want to work again, it starts to want to ferment. And now we've compressed it in a cigar. That's why we put them into cold rooms and aging rooms for usually anywhere from 30, sometimes depending on Maduro's take, for instance, a little bit longer, anywhere from 30 to 90 days to let them cool down, settle down, uh, certainly before we put them in cellophane. Because if they're wet when they go in the cellophane, they're gonna be that humidity for a very long time. So uh, after they've come out of the aging room, um, We'll kind of try to lay all the cigars together that were from the production. Usually there's a little bit of a range of colors. You know, if you have two boxes of Macanudo Cafes, you may have a little bit of color variance between each box, but all the cigars in that box are going to be the same color, look identical. So we'll kind of sort everything by color to make sure cigars that all look as much the same as possible go in the same box. We'll box them or bundle them up, add the bands ship them here, and that's been two years since we planted those seeds. So you see a lot of guys out there too be like, well, I age all my tobacco. All my tobacco is two years old. <clears throat> that's kind of a marketing gimmick, right? I mean, if, if they've done everything they're supposed to do, it, would, it should be two years old anyway. So, but I, I, I go back kind of what I said at the beginning, when you kind of think about this two year process and the fermentation and the curing and, and how, the, really the fact that all of this is done by hand. I mean, none of it is, I mean, the tools you see these guys using are the same tools they were using 150 years ago. It's a knife and a wooden mold and at a table. Uh, so when you kind of think about that, it's really unbelievable that